Now, in order to be able to um, follow this explanation, there are three things we need to know. I'll just quickly say these three things, and then I'll explain them in detail later. Speed increases as flow lines come together. Increased speed is associated with lower pressure, and third pressure acts perpendicularly to a surface. Um, okay, well, okay, so if you have um, fluid, or uh, that means uh, <coughs> water or air, um, flowing through a pipe with a constriction, and if you assume, and as, as, as is normally the case, whether a hose pipe or water coming out of a tap, that the flow is um, non turbulent and that no, there's no build up of water uh, or air in the region of the constriction, then the flow lines will look like that. And that commonly happens. So if the um, amount of water crossing this cross section per second, no, put it this way, the amount of water crossing this cross section per second must be the same as the amount of water crossing this cross section per second, otherwise there would be a build up of water. So if that is to be true, then the only way that can be true is for the speed of the water here to be faster than the speed of the water there. Okay, that makes sense. So the picture will look something like this. We can animate that, and the, the arrows represent the speed of flow. It's quickly there, and then slows down out there. Right, so the conclusion to draw from this is that where flow lines come together like this, the speed of flow is greater than where they're further apart. So store that piece of information in your memory banks. Um, right, now, uh, conservation of energy is a well-known uh, fact of life. You can't prove it, but nobody has disproved it. So we all uh, uh, agree that that is true. The particular form of the conservation of energy that we need here is this, that the sum of uh, potential energy plus the kin kinetic energy is always constant. So what that means is that if I hold this thing here, then it has the potential to drop to the floor. So here the potential energy is maximum, but of course there's no energy due to motion, no kinetic energy. But when it, just before it reaches the floor, it's lost all its potential energy, but it has a maximum kinetic energy. So, and, and at every place in between, the sum of the two is, is a constant amount. So when applied to fluid flow, if you have a um, region of air here at high pressure and a region of air over here at lower pressure, then the high pressure will flow toward the lower pressure and in so doing will speed up. Think of a, a vacuum cleaner. Uh, the, the, there's the air over here and it goes whizzing in through the, the elephant truck um, of the vacuum cleaner. Okay, so that means that for, for air or, or water, for fluid flow, kinetic energy plus a pressure equals a constant. That's equivalent to saying potential energy plus kinetic energy is a constant. So where the speed is high, the pressure is low, and where the speed is low, the pressure is high. So store that bit of information. Um, now, uh, there's one more thing we need to know. As every diver knows, when you immerse an object in a fluid, then the pressure at that depth in the fluid always acts perpendicularly to any surface. No matter what the orientation of the surface, the pressure always acts straight in to that surface. Okay, so those are the three things we need to know. So now when you look at the flow around the sail, uh, we'll, uh, at, at this point we'll accept that the flow around the sail looks like that. And you will all have seen diagrams and books like that. And you can visualize this in a wind tunnel by putting a little smoke um, 
the emitters along here and the smoke will follow this sort of line. This actually has been done by a method called an electric analog method, which I might have time to say something about later. But anyway, uh, accepting that this is what the flow around the sail looks like, it's immediately obvious now how you can get a force perpendicular to the flow direction, which is horizontal. Because here the, um, the flow lines are wide apart, therefore the, they, therefore the flow speed is slow, and therefore the pressure is high. Here the flow lines are close together, therefore the pressure is low, and the speed of flow is high. And so there is a net upward force. This pressure here is greater than the pressure there. So there's a net upward force, and that is a lift, which is at right angles to the direction of flow. Oh, is that what I oh, do? Oh, forget that argument. Oh, I know what you're saying now. This is a stupid argument that you often see in books. They say that because of the shape of an airfoil, it's further for the air to go over the top than, than along the bottom, and therefore it has to go faster, and therefore the rest of the argument then make, makes lift. But there's no law of nature that says when some air splits that the two bits have to meet up at the other side. That's, that's nonsense. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. It's going faster. And so we can um, uh, depict that more or less like this. Here's the sail. And on the windward side of the sail, you've got uh, a whole lot of fairly high pressure regions. On the leeward side, there is lower pressure, um, but the higher pressure here overcomes the lower pressure. So we can draw the diagram like this, if you like, where uh, these are the net pressure forces across the sail. And of course, these could be combined into a single force up here, which we, is what we started with. And that is a, a different kind of description to what you will see in a lot of books where they talk about suction, which is a very peculiar thing which doesn't really exist. Anyway, that's another story. Um, now, um, uh, let me just, oh, I think, yeah, let me just go back to that. Um, now, I ask you to simply accept that the flow of air around the sail looks like that. But we might want to ask the deeper question, why does the flow look like that? How come it's got that, that shape, and um, which gives low pressure up here, and so forth? So in order to look at this question a little bit more deeply, we look at a simpler system. If we have a, a cylinder, and we have airflow past the cylinder, uh, one can calculate the flow in the ideal condition where there is no uh, viscosity, and we're not interested here in drag. We're only interested in lift, so that's perfectly permissible. And um, again, for my uh, French audience, when I gave this talk, that was first calculated by a Frenchman called D'Alembert in the 18th century. Um, so it goes back a long way. Um, and, and, and incidentally, it's, it's known as D'Alembert's paradox because the flow is symmetric, and therefore the pressures uh, on opposite sides of the cylinder are equal and opposite all around it, and therefore there's no net pressure, and therefore no drag. And so, um, and that, of course, is because he omitted to put um, viscosity into his equations. But again, we're not interested in that. Okay, now if instead of, um, if we switch off that flow and then rotate the cylinder, then it will drag air around with it and produce a vortex like that. Okay, uh, a vortex or circulation of air around the cylinder. Now if we switch back on the left to right airflow, um, then we get this. And you'll see that this looks very similar to the flow around your sail of your boat. 
uh, and clearly there's going to be a force, an upward force on this rotating cylinder in this airflow uh, because the pressure here is greater than the pressure there and so there'll be a, a force upward. Um, and the point about this is that if you stop that cylinder from rotating, then you get back to the original picture where there is no force. So it's the rotation of the cylinder which produced the force. And in turn, the rotation of the cylinder produced circulation. It produced that vortex that we saw in the uh, last, in that, in that diagram. But when the flow is, uh, the flow from left to right is superimposed on it, that is sort of swept away and completely disappears and doesn't appear to be there. But nevertheless, we know that that circulation is what is responsible for producing this lift. So now if we go back, oh, well, that's just there to impress you. Those, those, are, those are the equations that I put into the computer in order to draw those diagrams. Um, if we go back to the, the, um, the flow around the sail, we see that this, we, 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 will now, we now postulate that this kind of flow is probably due to circulation. And as with the, circ the rotating cylinder, we couldn't see the actual circulation. Nevertheless, it must be somehow present in this flow. Um, so um, that's that theory. Um, again, I uh, won't uh, worry about that. That's theory. But in order to be sure that that is uh, uh, correct in practice, we need to do an experiment and prove it. And the experiment that proves this so nicely was done a hundred years ago by a German man called Ludwig Prandtl in the University of Göttingen in Germany. And what he did was he got a, an airfoil shape, he put it in a tank of water, and in the tank of water were um, uh, fine aluminium powder. And that's what all those little dots are. And the fine aluminium powder, uh, when this is moved, will show the flow of water around the, uh, the airfoil. And so when he did it, this is what, what happened. OK? So let me explain that. When the airfoil started, it produced a vortex. It, it left a vortex in the medium behind it, called the starting vortex. And if you have a medium which is completely still in every respect, if you start rotating something here, then somewhere else in the medium must be another vortex rotating in the opposite direction. And that is called the, and in this case, that is the bound vortex. If I just go back, and show it again, you'll see that when it's moving, you don't see anything. Only when it's stopped, you see that vortex being given off, which was around here. So that proves that the lift which is produced is indeed formed by circulation of air around the lifting 